Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, welcome back to the Servants of Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And on today's episode, we're going to continue our series through the book of Psalms, looking today at Psalm 104 and God's glorious works. Would you please join me now in prayer? Lord, as we consider this great psalm before us today, we're, we're reminded, Lord, you are the one who made this world. You are the one who made the cosmos and everything in it, from from the very cells um, in our bodies to to the stars in the cosmos and everything in between. You made it all, and you made it all to redound to your and for your glory. So Lord, as we look at this great psalm, we're going to be reminded that not only did you create all this, but you order all things for your honor and glory you you order the, the 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 dust even the ever every single thing in this universe and in our lives are ordered by the hand who made the cosmos and us so lord as we look at this great psalm now i pray lord that that you would teach us that we would be strengthened in our faith that not only did you make all this world, but you uphold it by the word of your power for your honor and glory alone. Thank you, Lord, for the time that you've given to us now to open your holy, precious word. We're so thankful, Lord, that your word is reliable, that it's trustworthy, that it's binding on our lives, that it, that it teaches us about Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Psalm 104. Psalm 104 says this. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the water. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He sets the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You cover it with a deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they may not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys, they flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field, the wild donkeys quench their thirst. Besides them, the birds of the heavens dwell, they sing among the the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted, and then the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, The rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun known its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable. Living things, both small and great, there goes the ships and Leviathan, which you form to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. 
When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. And when you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Well, this is our reading today from Psalm 104. May God bless the preaching of his word and the hearing of his word for his honor and praise alone. The great American pastor and theologian, Jonathan Edwards, was converted to saving faith in Christ at the age of 17. He later described this as as a new sense of things that filled his heart, a sense of divine things, he said. And so he wanted to glorify God and enjoy the Lord fully. This conversion, it centered on a personal apprehensions in Edward's words of Christ and the work of redemption and the glorious way of salvation by him. For Edward's, his personal faith in Jesus Christ alone made all things new, especially the works of God's creation that surrounded him. He later recalled that there seemed to be, as it were, a calm, sweet cast or appearance of divine glory in almost everything. God's excellency, his wisdom, his purity, his love seemed to appear in everything. In the sun, in the moon, in the stars, in the clouds, in the blue sky, in the grass, in the flowers, in the trees, in the, in the water, in all nature, which used greatly to fix my mind, he said. He said, I often used to sit and view the moon for continuance, and in the day spend much time in viewing the clouds and the sky, to behold the sweet glory of God in these things. And in the meantime, singing forth with a low voice, my contemplations of the Creator and Redeemer, he said. Now, Edward's experience with his desire to glorify God for his works of creation, it illustrates the motivation of Psalm 104. This is a companion to Psalm 103, which praises the Lord for his works of redemption. Both psalms begin with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now, taken together, the twin psalms teach us in the words of David Dixon that the Lord is to be praised by his children, not only for benefits bestowed upon them, but also for his glorious majesty and greatness. Not only is he to be praised, for the works of redemption and grace to his elect children, but also for the works of creation and what he hath bestowed upon his creatures. And so Psalm 104 praises God for the marvel and the wisdom as works in verse 24 of this great psalm. Answer 8 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it categorizes God's works into the works of creation and providence. And along these lines, the psalmist praises the Lord in this psalm for creating and governing the world with remarkable wisdom. This praise psalm loosely follows even the progression of events in the first week of creation, describing how each realm of creation brings glory to our God. And the result is considered a rare masterpiece of sacred poetry. And yet the psalmist study has not only the creation itself exclusively in view, but especially the glorious wisdom of the creator. J.J. Stuart Perome thus describes the psalm as a bright and a living picture of God's creative power, pouring life and gladness throughout the universe, he says. Now the first two days of creation, they show God saying, let there be light in Genesis 1-3. And then separating the skies above the earth in Genesis 1, 6 through 8. And so looking on this realm of the air, the psalmist praises God for his glory. In Psalm 104, 1 through 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. So the idea of God's clothing himself with light, it makes the point that Though God is invisible in his nature, he makes himself known by his creation. God reveals himself by his works, which he puts on like a robe. 
And John Calvin writes that as he irritates the whole world by his splendor, this is a garment in which he who is hidden in himself appears in a manner visible to us. Moreover, the Lord stretches out the heavens like a ten in verse 2. And here we see the idea that God takes up his dwelling with his creation, stretching out the heavens like a ten over his head. The world is therefore alive with the presence and the power of its maker. In Psalm 104, 3, he says, He lays the beams of his chamber on the waters, by which the psalmist envisions the tabernacle of the skies, resting securely on the pillars of the horizon. The heavenly king also possesses royal transport, making the clouds of his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind in Psalm 104, verse 3. On Mount Sinai and in the dedication of Solomon's temple, the Lord appeared in his radiant glory cloud. And now gazing on the cotton ball clouds rolling through the skies, the psalmist thus thinks of God's sovereign effects on the earth, where he says he drives about the winds and the clouds at his pleasure, sending them hither and thither as swiftly as he pleases. Psalm 104.4 seems to make a similar point, saying that the Lord makes his messengers winds, except that the quotation of this verse in Hebrews 1.7 shows that it refers here, or there, I mean, to angels. The angels belong with the heavenly objects of this opening section. Psalm 104.4 says, His ministers a flaming fire, likely meaning the seraphim a title that refers to the holiness of these angels as burning ones. Now the angels in their glory, they reveal the higher glory of the Lord, together with his goodness in making these ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation, according to Hebrews 1.14. Now starting in verse 5 of Psalm 104, the second stanza of this psalm, it expands on the land masses that emerged out of the seas on the second day of creation, according to Genesis 1 9. Psalm 104, 5 through 8 shows that God set the earth on its foundation and then covered it with the deep as with a garment, so that the waters stood above the mountains. Then at God's rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed them, our text says. And so this description, it shows God as covering the earth with water until the continents rose from the deep through great uh, convulsions. The picture approximates the findings of geological science, except instead that it shows that God as the active moving force. It was the Lord's rebuke that parted the waters and his thunder that drove out the undersea mountains. The area of these continents has remained remarkably unchanged over long periods of time. And that is because a psalmist asserts that God's decreed limits as the cause for the earth's stability. Psalm 104 9 says, You set a boundary that the seas may not pass, so that they may not again cover the earth. And so it seems that the waters are viewed here as enemies of God that need to be subdued. And the third stanza sees them as subservient to the Lord's life-giving purposes. Psalm 104, 10 through 11 says this, You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. And so these verses, they correspond to God's work on the third day of creation, in which the earth sprouted with vegetation, seed-bearing plants and fruit trees. Now emphasis is given to the way in which waterways are directed by the Lord to reach all of his creatures. And these creatures include the wild donkeys, which inhabit remote regions, and the birds of the heavens, which perch high in the trees and yet have streams from which to drink. And so the psalmist completes his first three days of creation with a sense of the joy of the new-made earth when he says this in Psalm 104, 12-13. They sing among the, the branches from your lofty abode. You water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. Now, the six days of God's creation may be divided into two halves, with the first three days spent preparing the earth as a habitation, and the final three days spent filling it with inhabitants. 
as the fourth stanza relates to day four, the psalmist turns to the way in which the world was designed to foster life and blessing. In Psalm 104.14, he says, You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate. Now, the marvels of plant life and horticulture are truly apt to give praise to God. The most abundant resources, green grass, makes livestock fat and healthy. Meanwhile, man is challenged to use his God-given ingenuity in cultivating the wide variety of plant life. It is man who brings forth good food from the earth, verse 14, by his labor and by his scientific genius. As, as man's understanding progressed, we harvested wheat, we tended olive vineyards, we reaped tall stalks of corn along with rich livestock. It, it is not mere sustenance that God designed, but delightful food and drink, wine to gladden the heart of men, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart, in verse 15 of our text. Here we find that all things made by God, they are good when properly used, as 1 Timothy 4.4 4 says. The psalmist thus describes an entire ecosystem of bounteous goodness, all bearing testimony to the wisdom of our great God. Now, Psalm 104.16, it sees God himself tending the creation as a gardener when it says in verse 16 through 18, the trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for rock badgers. And so even in the remotest places where man seldom cast his eye, the creator is still working wonders. And drawing moisture from the ground, the sap climbs up to the tops of tall trees where birds nest, even the massive constructions of the stork. On the lofty heights, the mountain goat frolic in God's bountiful creation accommodates their need, even as the crevices provide refuge for the shy and the vulnerable rock badger, also known as the hyrax. Now, not only did God create the earth as a teeming garden of life-giving delight, but he also placed heavenly bodies in the sky to mark the passage of time. Psalm 104.19 says, He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. And so we take the consistency of times and seasons with the predictably stable movements of heavenly objects as an assumption of nature. But you see, the orderly passage of the earth on its axis and its orbit around the sun are upheld by God in his faithfulness. In fact, Hebrews 1.3 tells us that it is Christ who upholds the universe by the word of his power. And so it is God who deserves the praise for the reliability of the measure of our time and the days of our lives and of the cosmos as well. And starting with Psalm 104.20, the theme of time and the introduction of the creatures on the fifth day of creation overlap. First, the psalmist considers how God designed the animals to do their hunting at night so as not to pose a danger to mankind. He says this in Psalm 104, 20 through 23. You make darkness and it is night. And when all the beasts of the forest creep about, when the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. And so God in his wisdom, he designed a time for man to work and a time for rest. Now those who live by the timing of God, rising with the sun and going to bed early, are helped to live a wholesome life. Now, having surveyed God's uh, creation of the heavens and the earth, not as a static painting, but as a living panorama, the psalmist finally arrives at his intended exclamation in Psalm 104, 24 which says, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And so the word for manifest elsewhere means myriad or 10,000, so that the idea is, is that of a staggering abundance of variety. The Lord's works in creation are beyond counting, so that after millennia of study, man is still scratching the surface in terms of our knowledge of God's incredible design. Derek Kidner writes, what the skeptic sees as a meaningless swarm of life, the psalmist teaches us to view as giving some inkling of the creator's wealth and of the range and the precision of his thought. 
And so we can see why his meditations on scripture amid the beauty of nature so powerfully summoned young Jonathan Edwards' spirit to worship. You see, the more that we see all the wonders of the world around us as the works of God's hands, the more fervently we will open our hearts to him in praise. Now, the the psalmist's elegant poetry, it preserves us from the grievous errors of the unbelieving world, which looks on the creation and fails to see the creator. Now, we know that we live in a Genesis 3 world. We live in a Romans 1 world. And what this means is that we are sinners by nature and by choice, and this affects our ability to see and to understand the world. In fact, Paul makes this argument in Romans 1 that we would rather worship what is created than the creator himself. And so to that end, I hope that the rest of this is helpful to you because this is going to help you, uh, what we're going to talk about now, next, to, to be able to engage and as you engage with other people all around you who reject a biblical worldview. So the psalmist's elegant poetry, it preserves us from the grievous errors of the unbelieving world, which looks on the creation and fails to see its creator. For instance, Psalm 104, it rules out the idea of pantheism, which is the view that all is God, and so that nature itself is deified. For all of his marveling over nature, it is not the heavens, the oceans, the mountains, or the stars before which the psalmist bows, but God, the creator only. In his reflections on the psalm, C.S. Lewis agreed, And he said, to say that God created nature while it brings God and nature into relation also separates them. What makes and what is made must be two, not one, he says. Thus, the doctrine of creation, in one sense, empties nature of divinity. But in another sense, the same doctrine which empties nature of her divinity makes her an index, a symbol, a manifestation of the divine. Now, by emptying nature of divinity, you may fill her with deity, for she is now a bearer of messages, he says. Now, just as Psalm 104 opposes those who make a god out of nature, it also rebukes those who would remove God from creation altogether. And seemingly anticipating the challenge of the theory of evolution, Calvin said that the psalmist reproves the madness of those who dream that the world has been brought into its present form by chance. And so it is no wonder that one of the gravest threats to cultural hegemony of evolutionary theory, it comes from those who stress the intelligent design inherent to nature. The earth and its ecosystems have such an irreducible complexity, they cannot conceivably have emerged from transprogression of random forces. 18th century writer William Paley argued that if a watch was found, its complexity would show that it did not occur by Raymond chance, but that it must have been designed. Yet the world described in Psalm 104 is infinitely more complex than a mere watch, something that scientists have to admit about the subatomic world as well as observable nature. So God creation, it reveals the wisdom of God together with his goodness, with his power, so that man's only reasonable response is that of the psalmist who prays in Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And having explained so elegantly God's glorious work of creation, the psalmist now more briefly turns to the second realm of God's work, his providence. Answer 11 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism defines God's providence as his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and their actions. See, God's providence has been intimated throughout this psalm, given that the verbs are mostly in the present. John Stott notes that the 19th century deists believed that God had wound up the universe and set in motion like a gigantic clockwork toy. The Bible teaches, Stott says, however, that God is a living God, ceaselessly active in the control and the care of what he's made. And so the psalmist is fascinated by God's wonderful activity in and for his creation. And in Psalm 104, 25 through 30, he's going to highlight the Lord's governance of movements, provisions of needs, and control over life and death. 
So what we're talking about here is God's providence, that God orders all things. He's actively, intimately involved from the beginning, the middle, and the end because God is sovereign over all things from beginning, middle, and end. And what that means is God orders all things in our lives. He is ordering the cosmos. He is ordering our personal lives. He he even uh, appoints and removes presidents and kings and rulers. He knows he moves, the the proverb says, he moves the hearts of men. Um, And so we need to really grab hold of this because what it does is it steadies our hearts in the midst of the times in which we're living. There, there is great unrest in our world. We look at what's happening in Europe. We look at what's happening in Asia. We see what's happening in America. Uh, we, we look at South America. We, we look all around the world and we wonder what is happening. Is everything just uh, moving out of, out of control and in, a, in a way that is total chaos? Is there somebody, anybody that, that is under control here? Who is in control? Because it seems, people argue, that God is asleep at the wheel. And, and, and this is one of the reasons why people refuse to worship God as creator. Because they think that God is asleep at the wheel, that, that he is totally disinterested in man. Now, what this psalm is, that show, is showing us is that God is in control. He is sovereign over the beginning and the middle and the end. He, he is orchestrating his sovereign will for his sovereign glory and for our sovereign and for our good I mean he is he is in control of the beginning and the middle and the end he is not as James says the approver of sin instead we're to to flee as as first Corinthians 10 31 says where, where the Lord provides an escape in the midst of temptation <laughs> the Lord is good the Lord is good. He He provides a way of escape when we when we're prone and tempted to get anger and uh, struggling with lust and fear. And we we should we should look to the Lord. We we should bless the Lord. Remember, as we've talked about over the last two weeks now, we should remember the benefits of God's greatness, of His majesty, of His power. That's what we're considering here today in this great psalm. So. Psalm 104, 25 through 26 now. It looks on the sea and views the various creatures together with the ships as a cause for praise to God, saying, Here is a sea great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things, both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. What activity there is just in the oceans, with fish and whales and ships moving to and fro. In his sermon to the philosophers of Athens, Paul pointed out that God has not only made all mankind, but also determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find them in Acts 17, 26 or 27. And thus, while the activity of the earth may appear random, it is in fact controlled by God for his purposes and especially his plan of salvation. Now, verses 27 through 28 of Psalm 104, they progress to God's personal involvement in providing for the needs of his creatures when he says this. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. And when you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. For all the vast number of creatures on earth, every one of them requires daily food. Not only does the Lord provide a store, a bounty to meet these needs, but he also provided a marvelous instinct that make each creature able to gain its needed store. As the psalmist sees it, each time a mother bird drops a worm into the throat of its chick, a lion tracks its prey, or a hummingbird drinks its nectar. God's own loving hand has opened to meet its daily need, just as a child at the zoo opens its hand full of pellets to welcome the eager mouth of a hungry lamb. Each living being dwells in constant dependence on God so that when everything and every need is met, we ought to pause and offer a benediction to the faithfulness of its keeper. Divine providence is further displayed in God's sovereign gift of life. 
Psalm 104, 29 through 30 says, When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. John Calvin says this, We must continue to live so long as he sustains us by his power, but no sooner does he withdraw his life-giving spirit than we die. In the mysterious natural process of life and death, the earth is daily renewed according to our sovereign Sovereign's purpose, life itself is a gift of God, so that his creatures should offer the days that he has provided for glorifying his name. There are people, including Christians today, who deny God in active and total sovereignty over the affairs of earth, large and small. Instead, they argue, even if God is the maker, he has stepped down from his throne to give sway to the free will of man. And yet, to the psalmist, such an idea is absurd. Reflecting simply on the data of creation, as Paul reasoned in Romans 1, 19-21, what is known about God is clearly revealed in nature, demands its only reasonable response that we should honor him as God and give him thanks. That is, general revelation it opens our eyes to the, to the beauty and the wonder of creation. And the only way to know the truth is, about what God has made. The only way to know God, his attributes and character, is to know him in special revelation that is in the word of God. That To make sense of this, what I'm saying is, we need to know God as he has revealed himself in special revelation in the word of God to make sense and to even begin to rightly see the creation that is general revelation. Now, the, the psalmist concludes with three applications that are very much in line with Paul's thinking. First, he expresses a desire above all else that God should be glorified for his creation. Psalm 104, 31 through 32 says, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. God rejoices in his creation because it displays his glory. Jonathan Edwards wrote that the end for which God created the world is a display of the perfections of his attributes. We self-centeredly assume that the earth exists for our pleasure, whereas the psalmist insists that its first priority is to serve in the glory and pleasure of God. And so with this in mind, having shown how God's work of creation glorifies his wisdom, his goodness, and his power, the psalmist expresses his most fervent desire for this glory to endure forever. James Boyce writes, This is not a wish for something that possibly might not happen, but rather a confident assertion that this is precisely what will happen. Because the glory of the Lord will endure forever, so will God's rejoicing in creation. So the psalmist notes that the creation itself responds to God's presence. Psalm 104, 32 says, Who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. The holiness of God prompts the odd response of nature itself. And so how much more should God's glory inspire us to offer up to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, as Hebrews 12, 28 says. And as a second application, the psalmist resolves to devote all of his days to praising God. Psalm 104, 33 says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. Then feeling immediately how unworthy he is to even give praise to God, he says this in Psalm 104, 34, May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. And now here we discover the true essence of worship. As a psalmist concerns himself not with what he will get out of worship, but rather with what God will think of his praise. What good news it is for the believer to learn that our praises are acceptable to God when offered through the mediation of his Son alone. And, when, and especially when we worship according to the Word of God, redeemed believers may have the confidence of, of joy of knowing that our worship is pleasing to God. Hebrews 13, 15 says of Jesus through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. The, the psalmist concludes with a plea for the wicked to be judged. In Psalm 104, 35, he says, Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Now, the psalmist's reasoning is that the rebellion of sinners on the earth mars the, the Lord's delight in what he's made. With this God-centered passion, he prays for this offense uh, to the Lord to be removed. And as a third application, Christians should be grieved that the unbelieving uh, mankind denies uh, to the Lord the glory due to his works. 
our privilege in Christ is to pray and to labor for their conversion to faith through our witness of the gospel. Meanwhile, the Christian knows that the rebellious sinners who persist in unbelief will nonetheless end up glorifying God. You see, through our salvation in Christ, we glorify the grace of God. But should sinners be consumed from the earth, God will still have the praise that he alone deserves, in this case, for the glory of his perfect justice and wrath. Now, when Jesus was encouraging the faith of the Emmaus Road disciples, he interpreted to all of them in all the scripture the things concerning himself in Luke 24, 27. Where, we might then ask, as Jesus found in Psalm 104, a psalm of praise to the Creator, we can see Jesus all throughout Psalm 103 with its thanks to God for his work of redemption. But can we find things concerning Jesus in Psalm 104? One valid answer would be to point out that Christ, as the Word, was present with the Father in his work of creation. John 1, 2-3 says that Jesus was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. An equally valid approach was given by Stuart Hine in his hymn, How Great Thou Art, in which he sees the wonder of God's creation as a foretaste of his thanks for the greater work of redemption in Christ. In fact, he invites us to take up this theme of praise to the glory of our Creator and Redeemer when he says these words. When through the woods and forest glads I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from the lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Let's pray. Lord, how great thou art. How majestic, how beautiful, how, how lovely you are, Lord. Help us to speak clearly of your greatness, of your majesty in a time of of great confusion where the creature, instead of worshiping the creator, worships themselves. So Lord, help us to be clear about your perfections, about your character, about your attributes. And Lord, as, as we are, strengthen our faith, strengthen our resolve, increase our boldness and our desire to honor you and glorify you. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful psalm and for all that you've taught us through it. Now take it, Lord, and use it in our lives to bear honor and glory and much fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.